Hey everybody and welcome to Breaking Biotech. I hope everybody is doing well today. My name is Matt and thank you very much for listening or watching. Today we're talking about Biogen and I did do a video on this a few months ago because of the interesting Alzheimer's data they, they brought out with Band 2401. And the reason why I'm talking about it today is that they are going to be presenting an updated subgroup analysis for this product in uh, at the clinical trials on Alzheimer's disease conference that's happening in Barcelona at the end of this week. So, I'm uh, yeah, I'm I'm tempted to to put a short on the company, um, but I'll explain why it's more complicated than that, and uh, then we'll finish up with a portfolio overview because um, you know we'll get to see how how well I'm being crushed right now. And uh, just to give an update on the XBI in general, I uh, I did do a tweet showing the doji that we had on the weekly chart but the xbi is getting crushed right now and the outflows are, are no joke uh we're basically at the you know spring of 2018 levels right now and uh i think this is a reason why it's uh, it's useful to have shorts in your portfolio because you know these declines uh might have nothing to do with biotech they might just have to do with money flying to safety and biotech is definitely not a safety asset usually so if you have a short, um, you know it would it would have done very well in here. Even like companies that that show a lot of cash, uh, uh, they're able to generate a lot of cash. They're still getting hammered in this uh, in this bloodbath. So um, yeah, so important to have shorts. Let's uh, let's hope that the the damage is done for today or for this week. But uh, but we'll see. So Biogen has not uh, been inspired. This they uh, they've seen a, a couple weeks of decline as well. And uh, if we just remember through the chart, so earlier in the year, they uh, announced data revolving their uh, antibody against um, amyloid beta protofibrils. So just to give an overview of Biogen, they are in a ton of different areas. They, they have medicines against um, SMA. They also have some MS medicines that are doing very well. I was putting together, I'll, I'll show it in a bit, I, show, I put together a model um, and they have they have a lot of molecules. They have a lot of clinical trials going on. So it's hard to really pin Biogen into a corner, and uh, and you know they're they're pretty committed in terms of trying to get medicines that treat these diseases. So I think even though I'm going to talk negatively about Band two four zero one, their aducanumab antibody looks like it has a lot of potential as well. And uh, even though we're not going to see results from that until twenty twenty, um, I think in the short term there's going to be some volatility. Uh, this week anyway, because they're doing an earnings call on the 23rd. And then the next day, I believe, is the uh, presentation at CTAD where they're going to do updates on a lot of their uh, on a lot of their projects. And they're also going to do the, the subgroup analysis. And I feel like they're doing all of these at once to kind of drown out any single messages to take away from the, the conference. But uh, the reason for that is that you know, I in my last video I presented my thoughts on their their data, and it really looked like the only differences that were seen were due to this to the APOE4 differences between the placebo and the 10 milligram per kg biweekly group. So just to give a little bit of background, um, you know, Alzheimer's it's a it's a disease that's associated with cognitive decline. Um, a lot of it progresses as well, and there's no real good treatments for it. Dinepazil treats the symptoms, and some of the other, I think memantine's another one that, that does uh, similar things. And it's it doesn't help the disease progression at all, but it does help with the symptoms. So there's a lot of potential in here for a company to come in and uh, treat the actual disease because there's nothing out there right now that, that does that. So, uh, so Biogen has taken on the task, and there's two different theories that go along with Alzheimer's. I talked about that in this last video. I'm just going to say quickly, though, that the uh, amyloid beta theory is that these plaques that build up in your brain, somehow they lead to this neuronal damage and uh, death of the neurons, and then you get these cognitive declines. And the tau theory, which is like that hyperphosphorylated tau, has a role in this too, and it might be both. And uh, Biogen has antibodies, or uh, I shouldn't say they're all antibodies. They have compounds that are involved in both of these hypotheses, but... The more developed ones are the amyloid products. So aducanumab binds to the uh, amyloid beta oligomers, 
and band 2401 binds to the fibrils or the protofibrils. So the more, um, the larger aggregates, whereas aducanumab is the smaller oligomers, which might just have a few members of amyloid beta attached to each other. So they're, they're a little bit different, even though they both lead to a decrease in these plaques that are formed in the brain. So, um, yeah, so, so I was reading a few articles. The, the Nature article on aducanumab is, uh, is very good. They, it's very convincing, and they show a very good uh, effect, and they talk about their preclinical data that looks really good. So I think the fact that they're doing two phase three trials for aducanumab suggests that they're very much expecting a lot from this compound, and as they should. But uh, band 2401, on the other hand, is, uh, is a little bit different. So, uh, so I talked about this already. I'll just mention quickly that at CTAD uh, 2018, so they're doing an update on 2401, and they're also doing biomarkers. And uh, it's a symposium, so um, you know it's, it's going to be a pretty long presentation. And uh, then they're following it up with uh, aducanumab, so they're, they're doing like related or like, uh, post, um, the, the markers that they collect after the, st most of the studies conducted, they do like extra analyses or like the open trial stuff. So they're commenting on that. They're doing another, uh, study talking about sleep wake regulation. So they're talking about a lot of different stuff. Um, but the one that I think is most relevant is this band two, four, zero one, because it's going to say whether or not they're going to they're likely to take band 2401 to uh, a phase three trial. And uh, I'm not sure. And they haven't really commented on whether or not the FDA, they've spoken with the FDA about this data, which they said they would, even though that was, I think, uh, July. So it's only a few months since then. But, it, you know, it'd be nice to get an update on that. So so I'm going to be watching this to, to see what comes out. But anyway, before I get too off base, uh, let's talk about the, the data that they did release. So it was uh, about a thousand patients. They had multiple doses of band two four zero one and uh, and one placebo group, and the primary uh, primary endpoint was ADCOMS, which is a uh, it's it's a composite measure of cognitive function, memory, language, a bunch of these things, and then they also looked at ADAS COG, CDRSB, which are a little bit different. They're more specialized. I think. Uh, CDRSB is cognition and functional performance. ADAS COG is memory and language. So some of them are kind of focused in one area, even though they all do look at cognition as a whole. And then they also looked at uh, measures in CSF, so uh, cerebrospinal fluid of tau, as well as the, the plaques. They can look and see whether or not that's decreased in the brain. Okay, so the problematic part here is that uh, 26 patients in the band 2401 group had to discontinue and they stopped recruiting people to the 10 mg per kg biweekly dose if they were APOE4 positive because the uh, regulator, not the FDA, some outside the U.S. regulator said that they, for health reasons or something, they, um, they wanted these patients to be uh, no longer put in that high dose for safety. And as we know, APOE4 is associated with a more um, severe presentation of Alzheimer's disease, and they tend to have a quicker cognitive decline. So you would expect that. I pulled up a paper here. So this is one paper, and it's a little bit controversial. I don't think it's completely established whether or not uh, APOE4 is... Um, a big deal when it comes to, to determining it, but it's at least in the clinical, for, for clinical relevance, it's important that we uh, separate these patients just so that we know what's going on, if, if they are affected more or less. But so this is one paper that shows that um, APOE4 significantly accelerates rates of decline. And uh, yes, then another one showed that um, that it was actually associated with faster memory decline, but it didn't have anything to do with processing speed. So all of these different metrics of measuring uh, cognition and, and function, it seems like APOE4 might be only affecting a certain part of that and not anything else. But I think it's safe to say that it's a little bit controversial when it comes to this. So if we go back to the study, the... One second here. So... Uh, 
the placebo group, 71% of people had uh, were ApoE4 positive, and they say here that 72% of the band 2401 group were also ApoE4 positive, but that's the combined amount. So one thing that's uh, annoying as hell, I gotta say, is that they uh, they didn't really split up evenly the number of ApoE4 patients, and uh, I'm not sure why. It's it's peculiar, and I wonder if they just took the people that were on um, the people that they forced to discontinue from the 10 milligram per kg dose biweekly. If they just moved them to the 10 milligram per kg dose monthly, and that's why there's so many in that group. So I'm just gonna fast forward to the end and spoil it for everybody, but. Uh, if you look here, so, okay, so placebo, 245 people, 173 are APOE positive. That's like 71%. But if you look here, you know, we have a decent, okay, maybe this is a little higher than 71. Maybe this is about uh, 80, uh, you know, maybe 85 here. But then look at the 10 mg per kg dose monthly. 225 patients out of 253 were APOE, po APOE4 positive, which is like 90% of the patients. So, you know, there's a huge difference here. And then if you go to the 10 mg per kick biweekly, this is about 30 patients. So, you know, it, it's uh, it makes it difficult to, to really get a good conclusion unless you do these subgroup analyses, which they said they would do. So the really the end of the call, the big takeaway was that look out for our subgroup analyses, which will have more data. And that's what we're going to be seeing in uh, on Thursday. So, but the, the, the takeaway also is that we would expect placebo to do worse given more patients are able E4 positive. Whereas the 10 mg per kg dose biweekly, only 30% of the patients are able E4 positive. So we would expect them to do better. And of course that is what we see. So amongst uh, most of the metrics, they did better. It wasn't consistent though, which is interesting, but I'll just show some of them. So the important uh, metrics for seeing whether or not the, the drug worked is this uh, SUVR, oh God, I forgot what it stands for, but it's basically able to measure the amyloid burden in the brain. And we can see there's a dramatic decrease in all of the groups. So even the 2.5 mg per kg biweekly, you know, we get a decent decrease in the amount of amyloid burden. And then we also see, so the big one here is the 10 mg per kg biweekly. Uh, it's down by like 70. Uh, yeah, 70. So it's a pretty big deal. But if we go to the actual cognition, every other group besides the 10 mg per kg dose biweekly uh, had no effect. So, so even though you see here that the 10 mg per kg monthly group had a decline of 50, in the amyloid burden, we saw no cognitive benefits compared to placebo. So uh, that doesn't look very good to me. It seems like, you know, we would have seen something if there was an effect here. So, okay, they can also measure amyloid positivity in the brain, and they did see a lot of negativity in the brain after treating with this, com with this compound at different doses. But when they looked at things like ADCOMs, uh, so here we go. This is ADCOM, so this is the overall... Uh, composite. The the benefit here, I think, was like 0.5 compared to placebo at 18 months. And keep in mind that this group here had less APOE4 positive patients than the placebo group. Yes. So, okay, so the ADCOMs and then the uh, ADAS COG, they saw uh, an improvement as well. And the CDRSB, they saw no improvement here. So overall, uh, this isn't super helpful because, because of the, the demographics that I mentioned. Uh, it makes it hard to really come with a conclusion because a lot of this benefit that we see could just be due to the fact that the demographics of the patient population are different. And you know, if you look at the monthly group, which had a lot more um, APOE4 positive groups, it, uh, it did follow a lot the uh, the line of the placebo. So it's it's hard to come come away with a real solid conclusion. We could look here and say that, you know, there's a there's a slight improvement, uh, at least there's a trend towards improvement, and that might be due to the contribution that amyloid beta has to the disease, but maybe most of the effects that are that are involved here are actually related to tau. So it's not really a ringing endorsement for the uh, the amyloid hypothesis, but 
Um, in terms of making a uh, an investment, I think long term Biogen has a lot of potential, but short term, I'm not willing to make a bet. Uh, if anything, I might short a couple shares just to play, just to have fun with it. Um, so long term, they have a ton of studies where I think they're actually going to make a real dent in Alzheimer's disease as well as other things. But at least for for Wednesday and Thursday. So Wednesday, the earnings report, I, I'm not sure what to expect, whether or not they would beat or not. Uh, but in terms of uh, playing this, the data that comes out, the subgroup analysis, I'm tempted to short the stock. And I might just do like five shares short and uh, and just see, you know, keep my my total bet or my total amount of risk relatively low, but, but try and see whether or not my hypothesis works. So I'm going to be active on Twitter. So uh, if I do make any plays, I'll, I'll post them there and Definitely, um, you know, keep that in mind or watch watch for me on Twitter and uh, and see whether or not I play it. But this is super high risk and uh, I wouldn't recommend anybody to do this. And nothing that I'm saying today is really trading or investment advice. OK, so uh, so this is the model that I put together. Um, it's nothing really interesting. You have to make a lot of assumptions given that they have so many different compounds. And uh, so the assumption that I made is that they continue growing revenue at like point one percent to perpetuity discount rate of 10 so i came up with a share price of around 160 assuming that they get no other products so if they had no other products and they just let their uh, their current products the spinraza as well as uh textifera i've never heard that one said but um these would continue to to make big um these would be continu continually large revenue generators for the company and uh, and long term, you know, they would eventually lose patent protection. And Spinraza is going to find a lot of competition from companies like Avexis. But uh, so I think you know, as they get further into MS as well as they get further into Alzheimer's, uh, their revenues are going to are going to go really high. And so let me be very clear: this uh, this model does not take into account all of their clinical programs, and they have like over twenty of them right now. So they're going to be a huge player, uh, I think, long term. But short term, I think I might play a few shares short and watch for me on Twitter. So I just did a little bit of a subgroup analysis myself here. And just to say that, you know, the, the 0 0.05 improvement that they see in ad comms, I think it could be due to this de this difference in, uh, in patients. The fact that there are 42% less APOE4 positive patients. Okay, so with that, I'm uh, going to show my portfolio and uh, what we're doing. So we're almost back to even for the year, which is extremely disappointing for me. You know, this is mostly an experiment in seeing whether or not we can do this long term and generate some income. But uh, yeah, so the last three weeks have been very brutal. You can see my portfolio as well as the XBI have been collapsing. Uh, the S&P 500 is just under 5% right now. And uh, it closed on kind of a, a rough note on, on Friday. Well, I think it, the last week was flat. But anyway, just going through some of the companies. So mostly everything is down uh, from the last few weeks. But um, I did take a position in Sarepta. I thought that they kind of bottomed out around 120-something. Uh, so I bought in, I think, uh, in the low 130s. Ameren still holding steady. I think they're going to present some good data at the uh, American Heart Association conference that is going to get doctors exciting. Viking is taking a hammering. Uh, I, I kind of want to look at where they were before they released their data on um, Nash because I, I don't think it was that much higher or that much lower than 13. So it's kind of weird to see them that low, but I think it's just part of the irrationality of the market. Otherwise, yeah, Bluebird getting crushed, Spark getting crushed, uh, Atomus. I'm still holding on. I'm going to wait till the Q3 results, and uh, I'm going to make an executive decision to cut my loss on this disastrous investment. Esperion, we're waiting for their... Uh, cardiovascular outcomes trial, and that's going to be very determinant in uh, where this uh, stock goes, I think. Uh, I'm pretty hopeful, though. And uh, Amun, I think, has been bouncing around a little bit this week. It's, uh, it was almost at 30 again, but I think, um, you know, their rollout's going to be successful as it goes. But yeah, so that's, uh, that's about it that I have for you guys. Uh, watch me on Twitter. Follow me at Matthew Lepoir on uh, Twitter or Facebook and uh, leave me a review. Let me know what you think. Leave me a comment. And with that, I'm going to wrap up. But thank you very much for watching or listening.